Hey everyone, welcome to the third tutorial in my Intermediate Piano series. I want to start with a big, big thank you to all those of you who have been in touch with feedback about the series so far. Now the good news is that those of you who have been in touch have all said that so far I'm getting the level about right. It's challenging, which is good because it needs to be challenging if we don't challenge ourselves we don't improve, but nobody has so far said it's impossibly difficult and even better nobody has said it's far too easy. So so far we seem to be kind of in the right zone so this is the level I'm going to continue at. In today's tutorial we're going to look at some new scales just a couple of new ones but also talk about how you can develop your scale playing we're going to be playing bigger we're going to be playing more we're going to be focusing much more on technique because that's what you're going to need to help you as you begin to work on more difficult pieces. Just before we go any further, I need to say another big thank you to those of you who have signed up to support my crowdfunding campaign at patreon.com slash billhilton. Signing up to support me on Patreon doesn't really have to cost very much. You can do it for just a, you know, a couple of dollars per tutorial that I post on YouTube, and you get some fantastic benefits in exchange. So you get access to my piano packs, which are full of original pieces, exercises, useful links, challenges that you can use to improve your piano playing. You get priority support from me personally and you also of course just get to join my fantastic patreon community which is full of really friendly people we have a really good time talking about all kinds of interesting piano and music related things so if you'd like to sign up or find out more just head over to patreon.com slash bill hilton now if you think back to the first tutorial in the series I asked you to be working on some specific scales all fairly basic ones and I included all of them in score in the PDF that accompanied that tutorial they were the major scales of C G D A F and B flat and the minor scales of A D and G and importantly the minor scales I wanted you to practice both as natural and harmonic minors so hopefully you've been doing this a natural minor just to remind you of the difference it goes like this, I've done it over three octaves there, whereas a harmonic minor is exactly the same, but it has the sharpened seventh, so G sharp instead of G natural. And when you're, when you're practicing your minor scales, it's always helpful to do them in both forms. Later on, we'll come on to melodic minor scales as well, which are a bit different, but for now, we're just working on natural minors and harmonic minor scales. You will also hopefully recall from that first tutorial that I asked you to practice a bunch of broken chords, um, but we're not gonna work on broken chords today. Today, we're, all, we're just gonna be entirely about scales. Now the first important thing we need to do if we're going to take our scale playing and indeed our piano playing to the next level is to understand why scales are so important. They are absolutely critical. Teachers unfortunately often underplay the importance of scales. They nag you to play your scales but they don't give you a deep into insight into why scales matter and because of that a lot of people fall into the trap of thinking well you know scales are they're handy as warm-ups you know they're, they're handy to to kind of get my hands going before I practice my pieces but the pieces are the main event you know scales are just kind of a sideshow and that's absolutely not the case. If you understand why scales matter then it will help you to practice them more effectively so I just want to look in detail at that now let's do that by looking at a simple scale in the right hand I'm going to play the scale of C major over two octaves just in the right now as I do it let me name the movement that my hand and my fingers are making here we go thumb under thumb under thumb under third over fourth over third over and back down that was a really scraggy scale but it will do to um to illustrate the points i'm trying to make now those thumb under and finger over movements that we had there are critical to playing the piano they turn up in pretty much any piece you want to play any improvisation you, you want to play above a certain level you know once you're beyond the level of absolute beginner you are doing those thumb under and finger over movements now scales give us a systematic way of practicing probably 90 percent of all of those movements that we'll ever have to do okay and that's because each scale 
gives us very subtly different movements. Yeah. So if we work through all our scales, I know we haven't learned all our scales yet, but when you can play all your scales, major and minor keys, it gives you a very thorough and, as I said, systematic way of mastering those individual movements and training your hands, training your neuromuscular memory to have all of those individual movements at your disposal. So when you come across one in a piece, say you come across this movement, you know, the um, the sixth to seventh degrees of the scale in D minor, very characteristic gap you, you find in uh, harmonic minor scales. When you come across that in a piece, your hand just knows how to do it because you've practiced your scales. Okay, so that's the first important thing about scales. They give a system, give us a systematic way of learning hundreds of tiny movements that are critical to getting our hands and fingers in the right position and, and doing so smoothly. The other important thing that scales teach us is fine motor control of the force we put on any given note. Now, you can always tell someone who doesn't practice their scales enough because their playing is very uneven. They don't have that kind of... Um, the very fine ability to put exactly the pressure they want on any individual note and that leads to scraggy and rough sounding piano playing so when we practice our scales one of the important things we try to do and it's really difficult and it's impossible to do perfectly and whenever i play a scale on the piano you'll often hear me moaning about how bad it was because of this but one of the really important things we we try to do is play with evenness and control and that can take two forms we can either try to play each note with exactly equal force. I'm really sweating to do that. Really concentrating. Okay, we can e either pl try to play each note with exactly equal force, or we can aim for dynamic change within a scale, maybe getting louder as we go up and getting softer as we come down. And doing that in a controlled way will really help us to develop the force we can exert, to develop our control over our the, the force we exert on individual notes. That is complicated, as we'll see when we go through um, our scales and the techniques in detail in a moment. That is complicated by the finger movement. If you're doing this, you've got your thumb under there, you've got your thumb on your C and you're coming over with your fourth. It's really difficult to put the same force on the C as it is on the um, the B, okay, that is really tricky. You know, just putting the same force on those three notes, played with second, third, and fourth, no big deal. But when you've got an awkward movement as well, then putting the right force on becomes really challenging. So again, practicing our scales helps us to master that, helps us to work on our skills in a really systematic way. So when we then get to playing our pieces, to playing our improvisations, we're not coming across anything that kind of surprises our neuromuscular memory, okay? You know, our hands aren't thinking, our brain isn't thinking, oh, I haven't seen this movement before, what do I do? Yes, of course, you will still come across new things and strange movements, but all of the common stuff, the common thumb under, uh, finger over, the common you know, um, problems of exerting the right amount of force on the piano, you will have already learned and practiced because you've practiced your scales. So hopefully I've convinced you that it's really worthwhile learning how to play your scales right. Now, in practical terms, what does that mean? Where should we go on from here? So to start with, let's just think about the scales that you can play already. C, G, D, A, F and B flat majors and A, D and G minors. Up until now, throughout the beginner series, if you did it, and um, based on the stuff in the PDF from the first two tutorials, up till now, you've been doing everything over two octaves, hands together. Okay, now from now on, I want you to keep practicing those scales, but to do it, do them over three or four octaves when you are working on them hands together. We'll talk about the importance of hands separately in a minute. Working on your scales over three or four octaves gives you more room to practice each one. It gives you more room to develop that kind of dynamic control. It's basically the standard that people are set once they're playing piano above a certain level. So here's C major and let's do it over four octaves. In 
terms of the speed you're playing at then that kind of speed I was playing just then is perhaps something to aim for really good piano players can play a lot faster than that but that's the kind of speed, speed to aim for ultimately for now though don't worry if you're taking it slower than that now like I said a minute ago you're going to find that it really pays off to practice hands separately because when you practice hands separately that's when you can focus on the really detailed stuff that we're going to talk about in a second so what I would do um, for the time being is uh, yes if you can practice your scales as part of every practice session but depending on the time you have available just start, just focus first on playing hands separately do the right hand and then the left hand and maybe do a week or two of that and then start gradually putting them together when you start putting hands together and you you may well have found this in the past the thing you really need to look out for is that you stay um exactly in time okay it's really easy for the two hands to get just slightly out of sync so keep an eye on that it's also really easy to focus on one hand at the expense of the other and typically it's the right you focus on going up and the left you focus on coming down the leading hand you might say so just be aware of that and make sure that you're not making um, errors in the hand that you're pulling along whether it's left on the way up or right on the way down and um, you know tr tr try to get a good standard of playing in both hands so practice those scales over four octaves hands separately for a few weeks before you start putting them together after you've started putting them together every now and then take them apart and work on them hands separately because it, it really repays effort next thing to think about is your hand position now i'm a terrible terrible person to talk about hand position because my hand position is absolutely awful now <clears throat> unfortunately i can't help that as some of you will already know i've got a um a, a, a congenital deformity in my lower arms radio ulnar cyanostosis it's called basically my hands are screwed on the wrong way and it's not really noticeable in every way everyday life but it is noticeable when i play the piano because i have to kind of pitch my elbows up, up a little bit more than most people and it means i have to hold my hand quite awkwardly well it doesn't feel awkward to me it just feels natural to me but quite awkwardly compared to what you're supposed to do so whatever you do don't practice my hand position on the piano okay if I kind of contort myself into what you so-called normal people would think of, a uh, think of as a natural position, what you want is a good kind of arched hand position like this. I'm having to bend over sideways to do this. A good arched hand position with a little bit of lift under your palm so you can really drop your fingers down onto the notes. Okay, it's really unnatural for me, but that is what we're after. Yeah, so each finger has kind of a natural, um, you probably can't see this well, but a very a natural drop into it. And you should have it um, so that it feels kind of supported all the way up your arm to your shoulder, but at the same time it should be relaxed. You're after a kind of bouncy, springy feel to your hand, okay? What you need to avoid when you're playing scales is that the kind of the very flat thing that a lot of people do when they're learning. You know, really get yourself out of that habit if you can. <laughs> Equally, if you're used to playing jazz and blues, which is typically played with a, you know, a much kind of flatter hand position, if you're doing it right, then now is the time to adjust to that classical position of you know being able to hold your hand a little bit higher and let the fingers drop onto the notes a bit more, okay? Play around with it. Um, as I say, rather than taking me as an example, go and look at some videos of professional piano players with normal arms. <laughs> okay playing the piano and study their hand position and that is how to do it as i said if you're playing jazz and blues as well then it's fine to switch between those two hand positions when i'm playing blues especially my hand position tends to flatten out okay and that's absolutely fine but for now what we need to focus on is a really good strong classical hand position that will help you to play your scales better the third thing you need to do is to focus very much, and this is where separate hands practice will really help, but focus really hard on the transition points, the points where you've got thumbs going under and fingers going over, because that's where unevenness creeps in. Yeah, let's just play a scale of C major in the right hand again. Yeah, I've put my thumb under at the top, I could keep going. The typical problem you get is this. There's an unevenness, particularly thumping on the thumb and on fingers going over. Now, eliminating that 
is really hard. And this, as I said, is where separate hand practice is going to help. So one thing you can do every now and then is take an individual scale, and I still do this to this day. Take an individual scale, take it really slowly, and really practice those transitions. If you break one of those transitions down in detail, you'll see that they need to be really quick but elegant movements, yeah? So you play C, D, E, and as soon as your um, third is hitting the E there, your thumb needs to be coming under into position, and as soon as your thumb hits the F, the rest of your hand needs to be coming over. So don't let it lag. Don't, don't get to here and think, all oh, right, what's next? It needs to be F. By the time you're playing that note, that thumb needs to be pretty much in position. Same thing coming down. As soon as you hit your thumb on the F, that third needs to be coming over. Same if you're coming down from the top and it's the fourth. As soon as you hit the C, fourth over. And again, the thump is very difficult to avoid. If you look at the dynamic going there, you're, you're hitting the... Um, you're hitting the C with your thumb at the same time as trying to bring your hand over, and that naturally leads to a thump, yeah? So it's a real skill to try and eradicate that unevenness. And here's an important thing, you will never, or you're very unlikely to, ever achieve it perfectly. Rather, it is a goal to aim for. And if you do aim for it, if you're constantly focused on trying to play your scales as evenly as possible and in as controlled a way as possible, it will have massive benefits across your piano playing. Now, the two new scales we're gonna work on today are E flat major and C minor, which we'll cover both as a natural minor and as a harmonic minor. You can find both of these scales scored out over two octaves in the PDF document that accompanies this tutorial. And you can download that PDF very easily without having to sign up or anything like that by visiting billspianopages.com slash intermediate. Also in that PDF, you'll find a summary of some of the hints and tips that I've given you about scale practice in this tutorial. Now, if you look at those two scales scored out, you will notice that their key signatures are identical. They both have a B flat, an E flat, and an A flat in the key signature. That is because they are the scales of relative keys. C minor is a relative minor key of E flat major, and E flat major is a relative major key of C minor. If you think about C minor as a natural minor, then um, C natural minor and E flat major uh, as scales share exactly the same notes, okay? So they are relative keys. What we're gonna do is play those scales through and talk a little bit about them because both of them offer some quite interesting insights into some of the things that I mentioned earlier. By the way, if you've been through my beginner's piano course, you might find these a bit familiar because I think we touched on them towards the end of that course, but I haven't been asking you to practice them in this course so far. So what I want you to do from now on is add them to your practice, refresh your memory of them if you have played them before, and if not, you can get to grips with uh, learning them. So first of all, let's play through E flat major just in three octaves. Here we go. Now, there is one very, very tricky bit in E flat major, and it is coming down in the right hand. Let's start at the top. As you can see, we've got both of our third fingers on E flat to start and finish, okay? This isn't one of those where you're starting on a thumb. We're starting on a black note, um, so we can't use our thumb easily, so we're using third fingers. All that's covered in the PDF. But let's just get to the um, top. Let's go from there. And now let's come down. We're gonna come E flat, D, C, B flat. A flat. Now look at that big swing over. You might think C major is bad enough. Let's play up this scale of C major and come down again because we got our thumb on C and have to come over to the B natural. But in E flat, we're in the same position except we're coming all the way over to a B flat. Yeah. Now that is really worth isolating and practicing by itself because that is the trickiest thing in the entire scale. There's nothing in the left or going up in the right to. to to compare with that. And it's really quite tricky to play that smooth, smoothly and comfortably. It really challenges you to get your hands moving without you know, um, putting yourself off balance and all the rest of it. So that's the thing to identify in this scale. Like I said earlier, pr practice these with separate hands to start with. Go to the score, play through the right hand first, 
then the left hand, maybe just do a couple of octaves to start with, then gradually move out to three and four. And I would spend quite some time just working on them hands separately, especially to master that uh, right hand in the descent. Now let's have a look at C natural minor, again just over three octaves. Fractionally easier because we're starting on, on C's on our thumbs, we've still got that big leap over though. Okay, so watch out for that again, um, maybe practice it with separate hands. Now let's have a look at C harmonic minor. Slightly different challenge here, and again, it's mostly in the right hand. We got our third on the A flat, then we've got the sharpened seventh, so we've got that very distinctive jump you get in harmonic minor scales. Okay, up to the C, and let's come down again. So then we have fourth over, and we have to get our third onto the A flat, which again can make for quite choppy sort of playing. Let's do it in the left. Whoops, start again. You get a little bit of awkwardness just there when we've got the C going over to the D. But it's not quite as tricky, especially on the way down. It's really quite easy getting over that um, big harmonic minor jump there. So take those apart, practice them, see how you get on with them, and add them to the usual list of scales that you're practicing. Now, like I said earlier, we don't have a new piece for you to work on in this tutorial. The next new piece will be in tutorial number four, and hopefully you're still working on perfecting Chacon. But if you're watching these things as they come out and you don't want to have to wait three or four weeks for a new piece and you're champing at the bit to try something different, then I have a suggestion for you. And that's that you take yourself to your local music store or your online music store if you have to and find some stuff to challenge yourself with. What I would really suggest when you're looking for music to play is that you stay away from pop music and arrangements of film music and things like that. And, and even sort of piano arrangements of popular classics that were originally written for orchestra. That's because those arrangements tend to be very poor as written piano music. Some are good, but most are pretty weak, okay? They've been put together on the cheap, basically, not very well, and they won't really challenge you and help you improve your piano playing. Those additions can be fantastic if you just wanna jam, if you wanna improvise, if you wanna use the chords and work out bits and pieces of how these songs work, that's fine. But what we're focusing on here is playing the piano in quite a traditional way, yeah? So what I would do is try to find some fairly um, kind of straightforward to intermediate level classical repertoire to work on. And in particular, I would see if you can find some good early music or Baroque music to challenge yourself with. So that's music from the end of the 17th century through to around the middle of the 18th century. Composers like Bach and Handel and people like that. You should be able to find quite a few editions of fairly straightforward works by those guys. And I'm going to give you a specific suggestion. I absolutely love this book, The Joy of Baroque. It's by this chap called uh, Danesh Argoy, who was a, a really brilliant Hungarian editor and piano player and composer who created loads of uh, piano education material and sadly now is he, he, dead, but he, he was a, a, a brilliant, a brilliant editor and preparer of music as well as a pretty good composer in his own right. And he's responsible for most of the books in this The Joy of series, you know, the stuff like um, the Joy of Classics, The Joy of Sonatinas, The Joy of Bach, stuff like that. Lo lots of books worth looking at. But I would particularly look at The Joy of Baroque because all of these pieces in here are at around about the kind of level that you can work on. And all of them have been very meticulously prepared. So they've all got fingerings, they've got dynamic markings and so on. Often if you buy cheap editions of this kind of stuff, you don't have that. All, all that's been done in, in those cases is that someone's gone to the original text, copied down the notes into a, a, you know, a music notation program, and it's gone into the book as is. Whereas if you look at um, stuff by uh, Danish Argoy and, and people like uh, people like Argoy, then, um, much more thought and preparation has gone into it. So The Joy of Baroque, 
any of the books in the Joy of series should help you, the ones focusing on classical repertoire that is, but do have a flick through uh, the music store. You should be at the stage now where you can look at piano stuff or anything written for keyboard. A lot of this material will have been written for harpsichord in the first place, but you should be at the stage where you can look at something and say, yes, I can probably manage that, even if not all of it makes sense to you if you're struggling a bit with mordants and some of the ornaments and, and, and things like that. Okay, So if you're really champing at the bit for something to play, that is what I would do. So that's it for tutorial number three. It's been pretty intense, scale-focused, technical stuff today, but it should give you a really strong foundation as we move forward into the rest of the series. In tutorial four, which will be coming out three or four weeks after this one, we're going to work on a new piece. Between now and then, I really want you to blitz these scales, really work hard on them, really focus on some of the challenging stuff that we identified, those tricky transitions and the challenges of evenness and control. Keep working on Chacon to let me know if you have any problems with that any questions if any of you want to record it and, and you know send it over to me I'll put it on YouTube I'll be absolutely delighted always happy to give feedback and like I said if you want something else to play something else to work on while you're waiting for the next tutorial to come out head to your local music store if you're able to do that at the moment and dig around in their piano music okay that's about it if you're watching this and you're probably already subscribed to my channel but I'll say it anyway if you're not subscribed to the channel just hit the red subscribe button and, uh, and get signed up so you get notifications of all my new tutorials. Um, don't forget to check out my Patreon, patreon.com slash Bill Hilton. Like I said, lots of great benefits um, if you support me on there. And also my books. By the way, I've got a really good offer running at the moment. It's a bundle deal on all the digital editions of all three of my current books, How to Really Play the Piano and Introductions, Cocktail Piano, and Seven Studies in Pop Piano. At the moment, you can get all three of those eBooks for just £18.95. I'll put a link in the description text below and probably in one of those little YouTube cards that pops up in the top right-hand corner. That's it. Any questions, any problems, drop me a message, drop me a comment. I'll be delighted to hear from you. I'll see you next time.